What's good, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games podcast. I'm your host, Andrea Renee, joined by the blonde nerd, Brittany Brombacher. Hello. And the not feeling well one, Christine Steimer. <laughs> yes, the not feeling well one is my given name. Um, so you are still recovering from the ailment that you had last week. Sorry to have missed Jared Petty. He sends his condolences for your illness. And um, we, of course, want you to be feeling better. I feel like a lot of people are getting sick right now. Um, yeah, it's, it was random. And like, I don't normally get sick. So this has been an experience for me. And it like it morphed from last week, which was like a cold thing. And then now to a severe ear infection where I'm just leaking fluid out of my head. It's Ew, wonderful. I feel bad for you, but also that's gross. <laughs> I don't think it's that gross. It's not like it's like disgusting fluid. It's slightly clear, slightly yellowish. <laughs> it's like not the worst fluid to leak, I think, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> oh, God. Well, oh. considering, not like as, build, as Brittany mentioned, <laughs> considering we leak fluid every month, it's not that bad. Exactly. I'm used to it. It's usually different time. <laughs> I love, I love Fever Steimer. She's my favorite. I just love you so much. Also, I just have to say, and I told you this when you weren't shooting, you look amazing for being as sick as you are. Thanks. Like when I'm sick, I look like a hot troll living in the garbage in downtown something or another, but you look amazing. Well, I showered today. Today was the first day I showered in hey, a while. Hey, hey. That helps. I also showered today. Hooray for showers. They are yeah. amazing. If you didn't know, this is your source for video game news, commentary, analysis, and funny stuff. That's right. We talk about what's good in the world of video games. And before we get to news, I have to say how incredibly grateful we all are for the amazing turnout at PAX East in Boston last weekend, seeing all of you beautiful, wonderful, smiley people, both at our panel and at our What's Good Games happy hour at the Whiskey Priest was incredible. And we had such a fantastic time in Boston. Um, Brittany, I know you have thoughts. It was really okay. So we had our little meetup at PSX, which, you know, that was something we kind of threw together last minute. This was our first real official meetup and I don't know about you ladies I wasn't sure how many people to expect I'm like you know if we get like 25 to 30 people we'll be good I'd say we had at least 100 there and just knowing that we filled up that entire section and everyone was there because they appreciate our content we've built such an amazing community it was just one of those moments that I don't think I'll ever forget you know, it was just Absolutely. so, everyone is just so, such an amazing community. Everyone's so nice. And people were coming up to me and saying, hey, I met a lot of new people here tonight. We're going to keep in touch. And I've had people follow up and saying that they've met a lot of friends. And it's just so freaking cool that we are able to provide that platform, I guess. It was awesome. Yeah, no, I agree. It was such a wonderful experience hearing stories about how people got into what's good and how people are connecting each with each other through the Facebook fan page or connecting in other, you know, communities and social spaces. It, it was just a really great time to really interface with the people that we, you know, that not only just listen to the show, but that we communicate with in online spaces, you know, like putting faces to handles and to like hit comments and tweets and everything else was, was really awesome. So a giant thank you to everybody who took the time to come to, whether it be one of the many panels that we did, whether you came to Paximania, whether you came to the meetup, whether you came to all of the things. Um, some of you were, were troopers and, and, and came to all of the events that we did all weekend, which was awesome. And a huge shout out to uh, Craig and Tyler for putting together our D&D session, which was oh my God, incredible. So, Daimler, so, what do you think? I loved it. I mean, I loved – I didn't love that I was sick, as obviously as sick as I was. So, obviously, if I've met you at the meet and greet or at the panel or anything, like, I appreciate the fact that you were <laughs> – you were very kind to me, even though I was on fever brain and like just had no idea where I was most of the time. Um, but then, yeah, so we got to play D and D, and I was super stoked. And I was like, yeah, I got to do my first like insight check on someone, and <laughs> I was very excited. You I knew had what no you were doing. Yeah, I had no idea what was going on at all. <laughs> I only knew because I watched Critical Role, so I was like. Oh, yeah. And like, I just did the things that I always th think are so cool when they do them. Like, 
insight check. I'm like, that would be so neat in real life. I want to insight check everyone. And then you did it. It was a, yeah, it was a really great crew. And I really liked playing with you, Andrea, because you were trying to be diplomatic, even though you didn't really know what was happening. Whenever we'd want to kill someone, you'd be like, no, we have to question them. And you freaking grilled them, like how you would grill someone in real life. And it was amazing. Meanwhile, Steimer was just griefing everyone, shooting I mean, people in the leg. I mean, in the I, knee. She shot him in the know, knee. Oh, in the knee. Yes, Who does that? Of course. Me. Sorry. I mean, he wasn't telling me the truth, and I didn't appreciate it. And that's how I don't appreciate things in a fantasy setting. <laughs> so just some, for some background, uh, for <laughs> just give you, I'm not going to go into the full details of the campaign, you know, that, that Craig put together, but um, essentially we were, you know, this motley crew. I was an executioner wizard, but that was a, a, nu- a nuker, a, a nuker, nuker mage. Yeah. yeah. A, a rock gnome nuker mage named Alora Dannon. <laughs> um so good and Brittany was a troll you were you were an orc an orc orc. i was a half half orc orc. or full orc half orc named be nasty (laughs) i was a dumb as a beggar rocks but uh, i was a hunter you were a barbarian i think yeah brit oh yeah of course yeah Um, and andrea rode on my shoulder a few times it's true Mm because i i mean i'm a gnome I'm, i'm small i don't run very fast um, and we were playing with Dr. B from Take This, who was fantastic as oh, Icky. Yeah. He was a monk, some kind of a monk. Mm-hmm. They could yeah, like, do fancy moves. And then uh, Wout, uh, the hashtagonist, was, um, what was he? I don't remember. Was he? No, he wasn't a cleric. Forgot. Tyler was the cleric. He was right? a rogue. He was he a rogue. Was, I thought you were the rogue. No, I was the uh, hunter. Oh, okay. He had the bow and arrow. Um, yeah. yeah, and we were both, on the- Jim and I both had bow and arrows, but he had a short bow and I had a long bow. Oh, okay. Yeah, we were on the hunt for a missing blacksmith and a missing alchemist. And we had to figure out what happened to them. And then there was murder and um, deception and f- lots of fire. I was a fire. I had lots of fire abilities. It was it was exciting. It was fun. It was. And now I'd I'm like, like do it again. I would like to do it again if I had to do literally zero work again. Because, Wow. That's a lot yeah. of work to put that together. So a big thank you and shout out to those guys for writing all the character sheets and uh, drawing out a map. Like that map mm-hmm. work was pretty impressive. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> but it was um, it was great. And we look forward to doing all of that again at PAX West. So if you guys missed us in Boston, don't worry. Uh, we actually had some people writing in the Facebook fan page about trying to organize their own meetups. So if you guys still haven't been to our Facebook pan- fan page, you can find that of course, on Facebook. Um, And a lot of people there are trying to figure out which cities they want to organize meetups in. We're still looking at what's going to happen around E3. We will be at E3, but uh, we're not sure when we would be able to do a meetup, potentially that weekend before, before it gets super crazy. Uh, But we'll keep you posted on that. Um, But yeah, PAX was was awesome. Do, uh, before we get into um, some of the games that we played, or do you guys want to talk about some of the games we played? No, maybe I later. played nothing. We didn't really play so. much. Yeah, we were really focusing on panels this year, which was which was awesome. Um, mm-hmm. I know what you guys are thinking. Hey, Andrea, remember when you said you were going to try to record the panel? How did that go? Um, <laughs> well, uh, it went about as you ex- would expect. Um, <laughs> I showed up with the right cables and everything ready to go. Uh, I even brought two sets of batteries, so I had a backup. But what I did not realize was that the batteries I had were not fresh batteries. Um, so the batteries died uh, about halfway through recording the panel. So, uh, it's that's okay. About... I was like tripping out. It was fine. You don't, you don't need to hear that. Yeah, it's about par for the course for, uh, what's good. I, I, Very on brand. I commit wholly on my honor, scout's honor, whatever kind of swearing I need to do that I will record the PAX West panel come hell or high water. It will happen. I will bring a brand new unopened set of batteries Plus the electrical cord with an extension cable and everything will get recorded. So help me God. (laughs) Only if we can listen to your wedding music again. Oh my God. That was so funny. (sighs) That was, Was that was at first it was embarrassing. And then I was like, well, fuck it. So what happened was I was trying to play the theme song, you know, our amazing theme song to start the panel. 
And I didn't realize that it, the next thing that came up in my iTunes was the, the piano playlist uh, that I used to have my wedding party walk down the aisle. Whoops. <laughs> so there's like was this great. like really like crazy piano The tone piano shifted music. real fast. Yeah. It like, was. Da, 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 and it was like. Da, da, da. <laughs> yeah, it, it got real slow. Um, yeah. It was the uh, piano cover of uh, Christina Perry's uh, Thousand Years. Which is uh, the the song that, ironically, Bella and what's his face got married to in Twilight. Mm -hmm. oh. Edward. Edward. Yeah, that's the guy. Ed, <laughs> anyway, I'm rambling. That. Um, that's fine. We probably have some housekeeping we should have done, but that's okay. We're into it now. But this is uh, probably where I should tell you we've got not one but two amazing sponsors. We've got Video Game Abominations and Ripped Gamers. So I'll tell you more about Ripped Gamers later on in the show. Of course, if you've been listening, you know about them. Um, our new sponsor this time is Video Game Abominations. So what if there was a book filled with all of your favorite video game characters, but then... Someone decided to take the piss out of them. Well, there is, and this is it. Video Game Abominations takes all of the characters you know and then lovingly mocks them. This book is written and illustrated by gamers for gamers. The book is on sale now for one month only exclusively on Kickstarter. It's formatted like a satirical encyclopedia and will feature characters like Pac-Man, Solid Snake, and Mario. And on top of getting the book, backers will also have reward options to choose a character they want to see in the book or even get a character dedicated to them. Once it's gone, it's gone. You're never going to be able to buy another copy. So go support them between April 11th, which was this week, and May 11th, which is when the Kickstarter ends, and help them decide what character should be in the book. If you want a sneak peek, I'm going to read a short excerpt right here. The Pac-Man is a creature of enormous size and insatiable hunger. Unable to survive more than a few seconds without ingesting its next meal, these omnivores are constantly feeding. However, despite the obvious threat they pose, these creatures were used by previous civilizations as entertainment. Placed in mazes, spectators would bet some sort of currency over how much food they thought the creature could devour before it died. I feel like those first few sentences describe me. <laughs> His enormous size and insatiable hunger. <laughs> I cannot survive more than a few seconds without ingesting my next meal. <laughs> that sounds about right. Feed me. Um, so do you guys want to learn more about video game abominations and check out some of their illustrations, which are pretty hilarious. Uh, you can place your pledge over at, hold on, I had the website pulled up. Oh my do gosh, I'm dropping the ball. Music. Da, 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 music da, right da, here. Da, What's your best Pac-Man sound, Simer? It's... <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty good, Whoa. actually. Thanks. That was actually that. That was great, Britt. I don't think Aww. I'm even gonna try and like do anything because that was too good. Is that better than my other voice I do? Your dolphin? You mean your no, unsatisfied I, dolphin? My Muppet, my Muppet voice. Oh, I have I mean, Muppet I like unsatisfied those. dolphin, and now I have Pac-Man. Anyway, continue. <laughs> <laughs> I will let you continue. <laughs> it's Kickstarter.com/slash a book that mocks video games. Wait, is that the actual full link? If so, that's amazing. Because that is that would be a book. It's a book that mocks video games. Well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go, indeed. Um, so we will have the link for that in our show notes and on our YouTube description. Um, so that again is video game abominations. Kickstarter.com, a book that mocks video games. Um, so you guys should check that out if you would like to. So inclined. It's only on sale for one month only. Yeah. I feel like we're all a little dead from PAX. It's just like one of those weeks Bad where we're here. link didn't work. <laughs> we're held together. But that not the, is that not the link? Okay. No, like, yeah. I, I looked at the link. The it problem is, is the link has a lot of numbers in it. So you should just um, oh. you should just click on the oh, link. Oh yeah, that's a, that's a big old the, 404. Click. Everyone's watching this on YouTube or listening on their phone. Just pull up your phone, click on the about or the little question mark on your podcast app. We'll have the link in there. You just click right on that link, and it'll take you right where you want to go. Where you want to go? It's because it's so it's Kickstarter.com slash projects slash six seven nine zero seven five nine eight seven slash a book that mocks video games. Oh boy. <laughs> So that's why. So yes. just Google it. <laughs> just, <laughs> just Google. Because that's what I just did. That's what we do here on What's Good Games. We tell you to Google shit. Yep. Yeah. Let me Google that for you. My um, favorite website. 
All right. Well, how about we go ahead and get into some news, shall we? Um, There's been some interesting ones this week. Um, Of course, we'll be talking about God of War, our review in progress um, in the second segment. But it's gotten all the fancy review scores, which is awesome. I don't know if that's really news, but all of the reviews came out this week. Um, up first, Destiny 2's next expansion has been revealed to be the Warm Mind. Warm Wind! Yeah, I keep yay. reading this as Warm Wind, warm even wind? though it's not close, <laughs> but I don't know. My brain's just like, Warm Wind. I feel like that's the name of a fart. Warm Wind. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, I guess it could be. Uh, I mean, <laughs> the show's all about... You, you've got to have some really severe flatulence if it feels like a wind. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's true. really like going Usually, for a while. It's like, like, whoosh. Maybe like warm breeze, warm gust. We should subtitle this episode bodily functions because I feel like we've talked about Steinberg's e- <laughs> ear. Oh my gosh. We could. I mean, we you're could. the one bringing up farts. I just said warm <laughs> wind. I don't think <laughs> that. Here, I'm thinking I'm on a beach. There's a nice warm wind. Brittany's thinking yeah, exactly. farts. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Oh my gosh. Uh, okay. okay, so uh, it launches on May 8th. Let me get back to the news here. Uh, Bungie will release a second expansion as an update to the game titled Warmind, and the developer announced in a very low-key fat... Why am I reading this? Um, <laughs> let's go down to the thing that matters. Uh, thank you, Polygon, for this write-up, by the way. Destiny 2 Season 3 will kick off with the release of the expansion. We'll send you to new places, meet new heroes, and battle new enemies, and you'll earn new loot and master new activities. New, 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 and new, new. The developer new promises to, to show off the expansion, reveal new details <laughs> about, about it during a stream on April 24th. A single teaser image was posted, and it hints at what Warmind will look like, but if you've played Destiny, I mean, you know about Rasputin, you know about the Warmind. Um... So uh, also we'll kick off season three and new changes for uh, Crucible, of course. So my initial thoughts when I heard this news was cool story, bro. And I was going to say, hate, temp- Andrew, you're, you're, you're too excited right now. Like, I, I can't hate, handle it. I know. I hate that that's, that's how I feel about it. I hate that because I love Destiny. And I've put so much time into both Destiny and Destiny 2. But when I saw this news, I was like, I don't know. You're going to have to kind of do a lot to win me back. I'm pretty upset about everything. They're finally. So this is the expansion that they're finally going to uh, implement the new vault space, adding more vault space. And they're going to allow you to have multiple emotes equipped to that, which I I say, I'm sorry. This game released in September and you're going to implement these changes in May. I don't want to be like, how hard is it? But kind of how hard is it? Right? Like, when this is the only game you're working on and you have a giant studio? Like, I, maybe I'm being unfair, but I'm kind of mad. And I don't usually hold developers' feet to the fire in this way because I understand making video games is hard and it's a big thing that I don't know how to do myself. But I'm just like, you're Activision and Bungie. This game made hundreds of millions of dollars. What is the excuse? So, is it too little, too late? Yes, to win you back. But Andrea, look at how many times they were they used the word "new" in this in this blurb. <laughs> you've got new places, you've got new heroes, you got new enemies, you got new loot, and you got new activities. That's five things, five news. Steimer, as somebody who's also played Destiny, do you <laughs> think that the enemies are actually going to be new enemies, or do you no. think that they're just going to be reskinned I think enemies? Be reskinned. Right? No. Which one? Which one do you I think mean, they're I reskinning? It would be cool if they actually like. Did, did a thing that was new. different that was actually new <laughs> it was actually really new <laughs> but I mean, I mean but maybe it is I'm gonna I'm gonna be the non-salt one and say oh. <laughs> that they could be new and this could be amazing but even with all that I probably still won't play it unless you do so there's that yeah my I'm, warm I'm wind <laughs> your, your warm wind <laughs> I will lead on to Destiny 2 for that moment when I have nothing else to play, which I know isn't coming for a very long time. I just have no desire to hop into this right now, especially with the announcement of, I mean, not especially, but even with Warm Wind and all of the news. To me, Destiny is one big new because I haven't played more than 10 hours of that game. 
So I, I mean, but, but it's very much like Destiny One. Did you ever play Destiny One? Oh yeah, I put hundreds of hours into Destiny. Well, then you played Destiny Two. Okay, there I you mean, go. Yeah, <laughs> mic drop. I hate to mic agree drop. with you, but that's that's really it. It's just yeah, I they haven't proven to me over the last four to five months that that that, that this should get me excited. Like new activities. What does that mean? New adventures, new sto- story I mean, missions. Heavy air quotes here. Like the idea of new enemies. If it's just like a skinning of like the Vex. So I hope you got if you bring the hive back for like the fourth fucking time, I'm going to scream. And like I've got my fill of the stupid cabal with with Destiny 2. I'm just like, what is this new enemy of action? And like, I admit I'm I'm coming. I'm I'm pretty bitter right now Um, because when I booted up the game for Crimson Days, the Valentine's Day event that they did, I opened it up being like, okay, I'm going to give this another shot. I, I want to get back into it. I love it when they do these themed holiday things and, you know, they give you fun loot and blah, blah, blah. I pulled it up and I was faced with all of these items that were at my postmaster. My inventory was full because of course it's full. You only have so few slots to carry guns around. And because of the way the progression system works, you constantly have to be cycling your, your gear and so when you finally get something you like, you kind of want to hold on to it. But then you have you're getting all of this shit thrown at you that you have to constantly dismantle. And then you have to go put shit in your vault and then break shit out of your vault and then dismantle that and then put the other shit in your vault. It's fucking nauseating. So when I opened it up and I saw these things and I was like, I'm going to have to do 20 minutes of inventory management after having played Monster Hunter World where I could have all of this stuff in my inventory and never have to worry about dismantling and moving stuff around except for when I have like 900 pieces of whatever that I finally put them in the item box. But like, I was like, I don't understand. I don't understand why I have to do this. Why is this a thing that's still in your video game? When I was talking to yeah. Jared about it um, on Games Daily, because he and I were hosting together, he was like, you know, it really feels like something that's a, a remnant and left over from days when developers really had to limit that because of memory space. Because, you know, you couldn't, in order for the game to keep functioning, be carrying all of these different items. But we're clearly beyond that now. So I really just, like, don't understand, like, why they're forcing me into this. And I know that this is one, like, nitpicky problem, but it was enough that I closed the game, didn't even play. I was like, nope, I'm not dealing with this. So, sorry, I just got on my soapbox there, but like, no, these quality of life things should have been fixed at launch in September and they weren't. And the idea that they're not fixing them until May makes me mad, Britt. No, if there's someone qualified to bitch and moan about destiny, I feel like it would be you out of any of us because you have put, I think, most time into it. You know, it like the back of your hand. Going back to when you said Destiny 2 is just like Destiny, I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing. Steimer said that. I, well, yeah. Huh? And I yeah, agree. I yeah, yeah, okay. So whoever said it. Um, I don't know if that's really a bad thing. Like, I enjoyed my time with Destiny, but there's just something about this one that I'm just not drawn to, and I don't know what that, why that is. But obviously hearing you talk about it, like, doesn't get my panties in a tight, twisted bundle. Wait, that's not a good thing. That's a bad thing, right? That's what people say when it's a bad people thing. People say don't get your panties in a twist when, yeah, like, don't get mad. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't untwist my, my Destiny 2 panties. Doesn't blow that makes absolutely up. no sense. But, yeah, so I don't know. We'll see. Well, I'll, I'll keep listening to Andrea talk about it, and maybe someday I'll play it when <laughs> I have nothing else to play. Which is, never... which, which is a day that's never, that's never coming, but no. that's fine. There's, there's a lot to play. Um, yeah, that's all I'm going to say about that. We will, of course, check out what these new, new, new things are on April 24th. New, 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 new. new, new. <laughs> you have to say it five times. <laughs> and at that time, maybe I'll get down off my soapbox, but I'm not holding nah. my breath. All right. Next story. Twin Galaxies has removed former Donkey Kong champ Billy Mitchell's high scores. So this is kind oh, no. of a rock in the video game high score world. Arcade player Billy Mitchell, Kotaku writes, had his record scores removed from the Twin Galaxies leaderboards following a dispute earlier this year that many performed 
that many were performed using an arcade emulator. The ruling, which comes after a lengthy arbitration process, also bans Mitchell from further participation on the leaderboards, bringing an end to the King of Kong star's high score glory. All of Mitchell's records on Twin Galaxies, an organization that tracks video game records and high scores, have been scrubbed. These marks included a 1,062,800 point score for the 1981 arcade game Donkey Kong, as well as scores set between 2005 and 2007. The news was announced in a statement earlier this week, noting that Mitchell's scores would be removed in light of evidence provided by a forum poster, Jeremy Zelnia Young, that Mitchell had used the multiple arcade machine emulator to record his scores instead of using original arcade cabinets, as was previously claimed. So, like, the big hoopla here is that the motherboard inside the device, the, the cabinet that Mitchell was using, was not the original motherboard from the arcade cabinets. And so, because of that, there was slight discrepancies in like the computation of how the game plays. And obviously, these guys are playing at such a high level that every little computation matters because Mitchell you know, played a perfect, a mathematically perfect game of Pac-Man. So, no one's disputing the fact that he's got skills. Um, it was just disputed the machine that he played it on and why he did this, because clearly people are saying this was intentional cheating. And I had asked Jared, I was like, cause you know, he's a, a, a retro gaming expert. I was like, why, why would he do this? Why would he cheat? I, if he knows that he's really good, like, why didn't he just do it? And everyone's like, who knows? <laughs> it's, yeah, uh, know. it's kind of a weird thing. I find it weird that they're like, you're banned for life. Because I'm like, but just make him do it all over again, but on the machine you want him to use. No, because if it was intentional cheating, you know, kind of. I know, but I'm like, like I just want to see him do it. I know, me too. Like, Bitches and hoes, I'm actually really good at this. I don't know why I cheated. <laughs> Maybe what? it was just too hard to find the original arcade cabinets. Maybe this so poor what? man lives in the middle of America. He can't find one. <laughs> I know nothing about this, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> you so what's crazy to me is the whole dispute okay this is continuing on the article it says in young's dispute he claimed that direct feed footage from scores as well as other submissions from mitchell showed that mitchell had used mame young's claim centered on the fact that arcade cabinets load donkey kong levels from one side of the screen to the other while mame loads them in large chunks so looking at level transitions he concluded that his level transitions were consistent with those using that emulator so they had to look at this through on a VHS tape. So this young guy must really know what the hell he's looking for. I mean, I think of VHS tapes. I think of like vid- home videos, right? From like yeah. the 90s that are like super duper like low quality. I don't even know how. I mean, it's just crazy to me. I understand why people are upset. I mean, if this is like your thing, if you are like, if this is like the one passion in your life where you are competitive Donkey Kong country or not Donkey Kong country, Donkey Kong <laughs> arcade player. <laughs> Simmer giggles. Thanks, Simmer. And someone cheated. I understand. It's just, uh, and I'm and afraid Mitchell really isn't that good of a guy. I don't know anything about him, but I hear the way he's presented himself isn't the best. So I don't know if this is so much like someone waving their, their be gone with ye flag like they do like with professional athletes, or if this is just a legitimate, we're following the rules, we have to do this kind of thing. I don't know the politics of this. Well, we saying. haven't seen him come out and say, I didn't do it. And dispute it and say, hey, like, you can't strip me. This is bullshit. So maybe he knows that he did it. Whoopsie. Probably a good sign. Also, like, my, my thing, my point that I was making when I was discussing this was, like, I'm going to be honest and say I just, I don't, I, I don't care about this. Um, yeah. There's so much, yeah. there's so much happening in the world today. The idea that I'm going to try to get upset about some guy used the wrong motherboard in his competition. I think, you know, people are like, the reason why, you know, the people who this affects are really upset about it is because they're like, hey, like, you know, this was an incredibly high level play and somebody cheated and we didn't discover it until much later. And, you know, could he have been cheating in other instances that weren't caught potentially? Um, and I'm like, okay, cool. Well, you know, it's, it's disappointing that a guy that really represents video games in the way he does in a, a King of Kong, that he turns out to be not a good guy. Sucks. I hate it when we there's somebody that's propped up as like a champion or a hero and you're, you find out that they've been cheating in some fa- fashion, you know? I'm like, that's a bummer. Is this like 
the steroid stuff you see in sports. Kind of, like, We're yeah. taking this title away from you because you use steroids. Yeah, yeah. it's oh, okay. exactly like that. Well, pretty much. Uh, that makes sense. I mean, whatever. I mean, I, I hear you. It's not... It's not the biggest thing to get your, I can say it properly now, to get your panties in a tight and twisted bundle over. But I mean, you know, I guess it's all perspective, right? <laughs> I mean, to someone who works professionally in the field of like politics or something, like they might think your destiny to rant is like stupid and insignificant. It's true. So I, I would say, yes, depends. it is, sir or madam. It's all about It means nothing. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Speaking of nothing. No, just kidding. That was a terrible transition. Oh, that was good. No, I liked it. <laughs> no, it was it, it, okay. I'm just gonna keep going. Um, Fortnite servers are down. Just kidding. They're back up by the time you're listening to this. Uh, boosting the fortunes of radical height. So this was an opinion piece that came out of Forbes uh, last night during peak Fortnite hours. So this was Tuesday night, I believe. Players were kicked out of the game for emergency maintenance. Most of them did. Most of them head over to PUBG as, as a result. No. Rather, many fled to Radical Heights, which is free compared to PUBG's $30 entry fee, and the game managed to attract way more attention than would have otherwise. Thanks to Fortnite's outage, Radical Heights has surpassed the total concurrent player count of Boss Key's failed hero shooter, Lawbreakers. Of Oof. course, for some reference, Radical Heights is the Battle Royale-style early access game that Boss Key, the creator of Lawbreakers, released earlier this week. The big turn came when streamer Ninja started playing the game and 120,000 Twitch viewers went with him. That rocketed Radical Heights to be the number one game on Twitch for a time drawing 200,000 plus viewers across a number of streamers, including Ninja. The game is badly unfinished, but the glitches are proving to be part of its charm. It's wonky animations and physical disasters that remind me of the buggiest days of PUBG (laughs) when it was first out. So, of course, this game is in early, early access. Early, Excuse early. me. They've, you know, they've been very transparent about that. This is not a finished, polished, um, you know, V1. This is a work in progress. So, I mean, but you know what? Good on them. What serendipity. Like, how lucky did, you know, Boss Key get with this? Because trying to make a dent in the Battle Royale world is going to be tough. And I have no doubt that we're going to see Battle Royale variants in all of the AAA games that are, are coming out later this year, we're probably going to see something in Red Dead. We're definitely seeing something in Battlefield and Call of Duty, you know? And, like, for them to come up with their scrappy, like, 80s-style weird art, you know, game. <laughs> Get, are you are you Sorry. Laughing? No, sorry. I just had a random coughing fit I wasn't expecting. I thought you were though. laughing at first. I'm like, what'd you <laughs> no, say? I don't it was a joke. sudden cough. Just coughing. Um... <laughs> Anyway, congrats. I hope that they at least retain some of that audience. I think that this is something that PUBG needs to be aware of, that, hey, your $30 price point is probably holding you back. Maybe you want to go free-to-play everywhere. I mean, they're free-to-play on mobile. So I think that they – I'm sure the conversations are happening internally. Like, how how robust can we make our in-game purchases so that we can get rid of the entry fee? I mean, clearly they've sold millions of copies, so they're not, like, hurting or anything. But if they want to sustain in a Fortnite-dominated ecosystem, probably uh, probably not the wrong call to go free-to-play. I can't remember the details, but isn't there a free weekend coming up for PUBG? There is a free weekend coming up, and... um, I believe it's this weekend. And there was also an announcement that the new map Miramar is coming to Xbox One at the end of April. But let me see when that PUBG free weekend is. There we go. This is off of GameSpot. Microsoft has announced the next Xbox Live Gold free play days. That's a mouthful. Game for Xbox One and it's PUBG. It'll be available to download and play completely free April 19th through the 22nd. So this includes all of the things. Solo, duo, squads. If you want to get your hands dirty, your feet dirty, there you go. I do like getting my hands and feet dirty. Do you? Yeah. It's always (laughs) nice to rub a little dirt between your toes. (laughs) No? I love love Fever Steimer. Sand, maybe? Sand, rub some sand between your toes? Dirt? Mm. It's like similar texture sometimes. Depends on the dirt. I guess that's true. Um, Okay, so... Sources say, our final oh news story of the week, the PlayStation 5 is still a ways off. Hallelujah. 
Okay. We're, I'm going to read this. But I love that Brittany wrote into the show notes. I mean, no shit, Sherlock. But I've seen several comments on social media about people now deciding to get a PS4. Um, because the PS5 is so far off. I mean, did you really think the PS5 was coming out this year? Apparently, oh, man. the people over at uh, semiaccurate.com did. So this write-up comes Wait, from... Oh, they're only semi-accurate, so... I know, right? <laughs> this this write-up comes from Kotaku, of course, Jason Schreier. A, a recent online rumor got people buzzing about a possible 2018 release of the PlayStation 5, but that's probably not going to happen. In fact, from what we've heard, the next PlayStation is a ways away. It might not arrive until 2020, which, for the record, is right on par with how long the console cycle should be. That'll be mm-hmm. seven years since the launch of PS4. The PS2, or excuse me, the PS3 and PS4 were also seven years apart. Um, that makes sense. Having it come out in 2018 when PS4 Pro just came out like a year ago. I'm not sure. Well, okay. Um, I, I, no, I, I'm right there with you. I'm surprised that, I mean, hey, I, I understand the hype. I am someone who also loves the hype. But for for PS5 to be coming out this year, like that stuff would have to be in manu- You know what I mean? It have to be like going places and doing things. There's no way that wouldn't have leaked by now. Not only that, man, I am not ready for a new PS5, especially playing God of War, and we'll talk about this. My PS4 Pro, I don't need anything else in my life. It's fucking beautiful. That and my Xbox One X, perfect. I, there's just I, I no. I don't want to I mean, buy, buy another it. thing. I would, buy it. I, would I would buy it, but. And I don't, I don't. I mean, we would all because we have to. But like, <laughs> we, yeah, like we. I don't want another thing. I'm happy but, uh, with what I got. I uh, posted my God of War impressions last this morning when embargo lifted, and I got just on my own personal account alone about three tweets from three different people saying that now they're going to get a PS4. Now they're going to pick up God of War because someone had thought that God of War was going to come out on this year's PlayStation 5 as well. I mean, I don't know where people are getting these crazy ideas. I love you and I do not judge you. But no, just buy your place. Like semi-accurate. Get your PlayStation 4 Pro now. You have, you'll have a couple years to enjoy it. There's a lot of experiences on there. You'll, you'll be very grateful for Just, just don't wait around. Don't do it. That is all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Speaking of, it's back. Uh oh. Did you say it's back? Or am I making a, a fake transition? Fortnite it up. is giving out in game gifts as an apology for being down. I just am reading this hot off the presses. Ooh. Coming off of a, a rough day of constant outages, players on mobile consoles, co- consoles? consoles and PC <laughs> <laughs> were able. <laughs> The unable to get into matches uh, throughout last night and into this morning, developer Epic Games got everything back up and running. But as part of an effort to apologize, the company is planning to offer up some free items. And that comes from Jeff Grubb over at VentureBeat. In a blog post, they say, we messed up here. For Battle Royale players, this weekend we'll be offering a back bling gift that you can pick up in the store for free. For our Save the World folks, this weekend we'll be offering a troll stash llama in the store for free. <laughs> I kind of want that. I don't know what a troll stash is, but I'm into it. These make good (laughs) benefits will continue into next week as well as Epic plans to give the Battle Royale players a pack of Battle Stars while the Save the World players will get gold. Also, the 50 versus 50 mode will launch sometime next week as opposed to today. Also, in very important news, Drake said he's going to sing about Fortnite if they add a hotline bling emote. (laughs) That's right. He did. Oh, shit. So I'll, how much do you want to bet the people at, for, at Epic are like, make this emote now, go. I'm Is it the, hot, the hotline bling dance, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, you know, the. The, 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 the meme. The meme where the, people the, like the, made the, them throw the arms, shit. The arm swinging down at the yeah. knees, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That, that's, a, that's a good impression, Andy. They do that. He gonna it's sing about them. It's hard to do when you're seated, okay? You got to be standing. You got to be crouching. You got to have you baggy gotta sweatpants on and fancy <laughs> sneakers. <laughs> I don't and know. a well-lit room. I don't know either. Yeah. Um, all right. I was going to wrap it up for news for this week because we have to get to the next segment where we can talk about God of War. It's going to be yes. saddening. All right. We're going to take yes. a short break, everybody. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, this is the What's Good Games podcast segment two. 
This is where we have to tell you that we were provided copies of God of War courtesy of PlayStation. Yay! Yay! FTC Thanks, disclaimer, everybody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> well, that was great. That was um, good. So here's the shtick. We all got codes to play the game in advance. The review embargo lifted uh, Wednesday at 12.01 a.m. Pacific time. And many of video game outlets showered God of War with perfect 10s. 9s, 9.5s, 9.75s. Um, I'm going to pull up the Metacritic right now. because I was just doing that. <laughs> it is um, very um, not surprising for me as somebody who's been playing this game. Oh, it's on it's at a 94. 94. That's incredibly impressive. Um, oh. And I expect we'll see lots more user reviews and things uh, to come. So, ladies, dad of war. Mm -hmm. First impressions. Did it live up to the hype? Yes, and then that's some. That's a lot of Oh, okay. I was going to say that's a lot of hype. <laughs> that's a lot of hype. And for me, I was like, this is a good game. Oh no, really? I mean, I'm not like I don't again, here are all my I know Brit I I don't I, know. Simer, I'm what? Very ill. So, I think that may have something to do well, with it. Well, then stop playing like, it until you're done being ill, Steimer. Well, I'd like to be done now. Can I just can I can I do that? <laughs> be done being be ill, done? you mean? <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, don't let your disease tarnish your experience. So, Obviously, Andrew, my only impressions, I, the only thing I knew about God of War was what you had told us from your hands-on event. Um, and you had made it seem real nice. And so I fire up the game, and within the first two to three minutes, like, you know, when you just start a game and you have that, you can kind of tell how it's going to be. Granted, it's not usually within the first two minutes. It's usually within the first hour. But I was so, it was so emotional it, because it was beautiful, and the sound, just everything, the expression. I like shed a literal single tear as the, if it, within the first couple minutes. Cause I'm like, holy crap. I think I think I'm in for a ride and I'm, um, it's hard to tell. I think I'm about five hours, maybe five to 10 hours away from finishing the game. I'm probably 25 hours in right now. Um, and I've done a lot of exploring, so I'm not entirely sure when this story is going to end. It's, you know, one of those situations where it makes it seem real easy. We're just going to go from A to B and be done with it. But then obviously a million things happen Never in between. Never is. No. Um, I think it's a masterpiece. It's one of those video games that I feel like we only get one or two every generation. Um, the last game that made me feel this way was The Last of Us, I would say, that I truly felt like, holy shit. Like, I feel like I'm not so much playing a game, but I'm having an experience. Because I think it has a lot to do with how the, the HUD is so minimal and it's just so narratively excellent. Did you turn and off parts of the HUD or did you keep them on? I have parts. I have it on. It's just the okay. compass that shows up. Yeah, um, it's a, it's a super minimal. minimal HUD at, at, at yeah. default, but you can turn the HUD all the way off, which is cool. Yeah, that's why I was curious when you said minimal HUD. I wasn't sure if that meant you turned it all off. But yeah, I, it's it's one of those few games too that I feel like I can just I completely disconnect in the sense that I don't think about my phone, I don't think about work, I don't think about anything. I'm just able to sit there and enjoy it because it's so intuitive and it just plays so extremely well. I'm never frustrated except for when I was doing a couple of fights, even on baby ass baby mode. But that's my unfortunate. Are you I'm guys so playing bad. on the story mode? Yes. Or Hell yeah. Story mode. Hell yeah. Yes, I'm okay. also so playing on story not. mode. I'm playing on normal. How's it How's going? That? Well, yeah. well, I think that's probably why I'm like. This game's fine. And I'm not like <laughs> it's more than fine. But I think I think I'm realizing that God of War combat for me is like kind of irritating or I think what it is is the buttons that they've picked. Like I don't like fighting with the bumpers. It's just you, it, Can you remap you go it for square? I haven't actually looked at whether or not I can remap it. I feel like we probably could because uh, we did. I had to do that for Assassin's Creed because they also did the same thing where I was like, yep. oh, you like fight people with the bumpers. I'm like, this doesn't feel right to me. It feels weird. I'm like, sp like smashing claws. <laughs> but um, <laughs> and I always like I'd have moments where I'd, I'd think I was pulling the right thing to like throw the axe. But really, I was pulling up the shield. And I'm like, fuck, that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> like, I just found like a lot of. I guess I basically get good, I think is what people will probably tell me to do. But um No, just take it down to story mode because I I'm real bad at the controls. Like I'm not playing this game for the combat. Some people are, and if you're that person who wants to learn all the nitty-gritty combos and get real good, 
you're gonna have a great time. But yeah. I, just I to see what it was like balance yeah. wise, like oh. how 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 it is. Um, because I do think that's important for games like this. Uh, and for the most part, it is fine. Like I'm not dying every other second, but there's definitely like boss battles can take me twice, like a couple tries. Um, because I'll be like, ah, oh, I fucked it up, and like there's no health crystals. God damn it. Well, gotta die now. Okay, bye. Mm -hmm. Um. That's fair, though. I think now that I have played a substantial, and sorry to everybody watching the video, I decided to, like, lean back. Lean <laughs> I'm back. I'm so comfy. I lean look back. very jealous. I'm, like, really low in the in the frame now. I have, like, all of this headroom. Um, I love it. But um, the thing I love about the God of War combat is that it allows you to get incredibly precise, almost like fighting game combo precise, with all of the different options, the different tools it gives you. You could choose if you want to go bare-fisted with the shield or if you prefer to hack with the axe or if you're going to use the axe as a ranged weapon. Um, the different types of enemies that require different types of strategies. The unlockable combos that make you feel so powerful and give you such a diverse set of tools to work with. The runic powers are really cool. These different ways that you can use the frost power of the Leviathan Axe. I think now that I'm starting to get really comfortable with the combat, I might up the difficulty and see what the difference is. I like playing it on story mode in the beginning because it feels a little less overwhelming as I'm getting used to it and finding my way. But I've heard from people who have tried it out on like the really hard difficulties that it's rewarding in the sense that you have to be very, very precise with your combos. One slip of the finger and you, if you like throw a runic attack when you don't want to or heaven forbid you hit your rage meter when you don't intend to. Oh, I've done that. I've certainly that done annoying. that too. And like, cause it takes a while to refill your rage meter. And I love that it gives me options and it feels so fluid and it feels so weighty. And the throwing the ax and summoning the ax is just so much fun. I haven't gotten tired of it, you know, like 20 hours in, I'm still super into it. And I love that. And I love how they bring that axe mechanic into a lot of the puzzle solving in the world and how there's certain things you need to do with summoning the axe and throwing the axe in order to, you know, unlock certain things. And it's just, there's just so much to love about this game. Um, before I get, we get too in the weeds with the specific mechanics, I want to talk a little bit about um, kind of the narrative and how it, how it plays in. Clearly, no spoilers at all. We will do a spoiler cast at some point, I hope, because I think there's a lot to unpack as far as the narrative goes. But we, of course, are committed to making sure we don't spoil the experience for anybody. Um, so we probably won't name character names and we won't get any, into any specifics. But the thing that I was really impressed with, at least in the early hours, you know, obviously there's a lot of end of the story that I haven't seen wrap up yet. But I really like how they are making good on the promise of defining what this relationship between Kratos and his son means. Who Kratos and Atreus are and who is Atreus as a character. You know, how has Kratos changed to kind of this like old man Kratos, this guy who used to be so full of rage and still has that rage within him. We still see that in some of his really brutal finishing moves, but clearly has taken steps to kind of harness that, that and the anger energy. management class. Yeah, exactly. And I really love how it just feels so expertly done and how it's woven all these NPCs that you find within the world feel like they're there with purpose and that they're there for the narrative, but they also serve a mechanic purpose. The two dwarven guys that you go to, the two dwarf brothers who do all of your upgrades and you who run the shops throughout the world, I love them as characters. I think they're great. Mm -hmm. And I love that they're around all the time. I go through quest lines and thinking, oh, in most other games, I would have to probably fast travel back to a shop. No, they just appear exactly when you need them to. And I love that. I actually haven't used the fast travel system at all. Britt, can you tell me how it works? Because I don't know. <laughs> so the fast travel system, if I were to have like one minor, like 0.1 gripe about this, it's the fast travel in my experience, unless something I did wrong, but it doesn't get unlocked until I just unlocked it literally last night. Um, keeping this spoiler free, you will unlock that ability 
And the problem is you can't fast travel at any given time. You have to find a specific gate. Um, and then you'll find that, and then you'll be able to go to and from whenever you want. It's not a huge pain in the butt. I think we're so used to having the fast travel systems in games where it's like, I'm going to open the map, I'm going to select this, and I'm just going to be gone with it. And you can't do that in this game, which isn't necessarily a bad thing because I feel like when you do that, it reminds you that you're playing a game. And kind of going back on what I was saying earlier, I feel like this is the most realistic, I mean, realistic, you know, you know what I'm trying to say, game I played that I feel like this is just an experience. I'm just an experience. It's an amazing experience. It's not a video game. Like in Uncharted, you know, when you find a collectible, you pick it up, you get like that little sound that pops up. It's like, and then you, it sounded like a, a, Wait, what a was turkey? that? that un, uh, <laughs> an unsatisfied turkey. turkey. <laughs> that was, that was the brother of the unsatisfied dolphin. I call him the unsatisfied turkey. Oh my God. Uh, but it's just one of those things that takes you out of that immersion. Um, so it, it can be annoying when you're trying to go back and you want to quickly explore an area because you want to fill up, you know, the percentages on your map because there are a lot of things to do. Um, you will, it will take some time to unlock, but it's there. It's not the most easily accessible, but it serves its purpose. And I think it does what it needs to do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's good to know. I, I as I mentioned, I, I haven't even had a, a desire or, or need to, to use it yet. And, you know, a lot of people have been asking me, is this game open world? And it feels in certain instances, very open world like, though it is narrative based. So like when I went down to Sony Santa Monica and interviewed Corey and, and G at the studio, they tried to make it sound like it was much more linear than I feel like it is. There's a lot of opportunities for exploration, so much so that I got so sidetracked doing exploration stuff that I had maxed out the skill tree because it was unlocked to the because st- I hadn't progressed in the story and I was like hey I guess this means I should probably get back to the main quest line because uh, I was doing all <laughs> of these favors um, but but then I felt super powerful going into the next story the next story stuff but I love how it feels intuitive in the sense that it doesn't feel like I'm doing bullshit fetch quests which yes. clearly are pi- a part of a lot of action adventure games and a lot of RPGs but I don't feel that way um, for example, there's a set of side quests that you do in kind of the first world where you meet the giant serpent that was in all of the trailers, like all of the, <laughs> literally like every cinematic trailer you've seen that includes that giant snake thing. Um, like, hey man, what's up? Yeah. Um, he, there's, um, there's a set of, 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 of side quests of favors that you have to do is what they're called. They're called favors. Um, that all felt really that all felt really important from a narrative perspective so much so that I went out of my way to get them all done. And what I love most is that Kratos always has these l- like one liners about why we're doing it. Cause like any typical kid, Atreus is asking a bazillion questions all of the time. And you can hear like angry, annoyed Kratos being like, Oh, I don't want to answer your stupid questions, kid. Um, but, <laughs> but Kratos d- is me is like, he's just, <laughs> I feel like that's how I would be, too, if I were a dad. <laughs> or, I guess, a mom. <laughs> Just giving, like, one-word answers to everything? Just be like, yep. Yeah. We're not going to help them unless they give us something. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's so fun to do those favors. I also love that they call them favors and not side quests. It's just part of, again, like, the experience. Um, everything you do, Atreus does have feedback on the quest that you're completing. So you can tell that they, that Sony Santa Monica took the time to insert specific dialogue related to whatever quest it is they're doing, which further explains the relationship Kratos and Atreus has. And you do see it through like those one liner things, or sometimes there'll be reference to family history. And it's like, Oh, I'm happy I did this quest because not only do you get some great resources, you kind of get some insight into conversations that you otherwise would not have experienced that I think are really cool especially since you're thrown into this game not knowing what the hell has happened in Chris is like past 10 years I don't know how old Atreus is but he looks about to be 10 yeah I, yeah. I, I agree I think that that the, the the voice acting in particular is Ooh. so incredibly well done not just for the main characters but all of the NPCs that you've made and the facial animation the mocap the motion capture is just out of this world it's really really excellent and that's really hard to achieve even in you know some of the the better action adventure games that we've seen in the RPGs that we've seen. The thing that really struck me was when Kratos and Atreus are in combat together, a lot of times at the end of a combat encounter, Atreus will ask Kratos, 
how did I do? Did I do okay? Did I, was it good? Constantly seeking his father's approval. And a lot of times Kratos just won't give it to him. You know, he's just like, yeah, you were adequate. You know, you'll get better. uh, Yeah. Like, um, he said that before. Yeah. Have more patience. But like the rare instance, if you nail like a kill shot with the Treus, because I've gotten pretty good with like, like working down some enemies and then and then commanding Atreus to get the kill shot, Kratos will say like "nice shot," and like there's that like little glisten, the little door is open into Kratos's cold dead heart, you know that like maybe there's something there, and I'm really looking forward to um, seeing where that relationship goes. Obviously, you know I have not finished the game yet. We got the code early, but between PAX and Games Beat Summit, just have not had time. So hopefully by the time we do the show next week, I will have been able to finish the game and you guys will just start playing it. But I love that they're exploring that. And the emotion, the depth of the relationship between them, like there's some really pivotal cutscenes that happen in the first third of the game that really kind of tug at you in a way that I was not, not expecting. I hate children in video games. Um, just for the most part, like they just annoy me. Like they're usually like really. I think Clementine's the first kid I didn't hate in a video game, but I hated Duck and like was glad when he kicked the bucket. And <laughs> so I wasn't oh, sure guy. how I was gonna feel about Atreus. And he's definitely had his moments where I'm like, oh my god. Fucking but I kid. but I feel like this but, is so well written, right? He's like a real kid. He's annoying. Well, yeah. I mean, you would exactly like a real child of that age is just naturally annoying. That's like its state of being. But <laughs> I do appreciate um, that he's he's competent and helpful, and I'm actually growing to like really find him interesting and wanting to know a bit more about. Like I'm just like okay, I kind of understand your daddy issues, and okay. I. I just want to see this relationship develop. And that's going to be, like, I'm going to be just totally honest. It's the only reason I'm playing this game. Uh, I don't, I mean, I think the the lore is interesting in terms of um, mythology. I've always, I've always found mythology interesting in general. Um, but I, I guess I'm just, like, I'm more drawn to figure out, like, where they go and how it develops. Because, like, and I'm trying to say this without like spoiling things, but like there's just been moments so far. I think I'm at the similar at a similar place as Andrea is. Um, and some of the things that we just completed, like I was like, oh shit, like okay, kid, like I I get you now a little bit more than I did before, and I uh, appreciate you, I guess. I don't know, like I I appreciate you and where you're coming from. Like you became a little bit more real less like a just stereotypical kid in a video game kind of a shtick um i uh, obviously i'm not going to speak on this because i'm significantly farther than you ladies are but something i also really appreciate about the game is have you read the journal if you open it up it tells talks about your goals and like what you're currently doing it's all written from atreus's perspective his point of view and so if you go through it, you'll see Atreus being like, so today dad and I did this, that, and the other, and we found this. And oh, I guess this, that, I, I can't say what, but um, if you haven't looked at the journal in the game, do it. It's really cute because it is written from his perspective, the quest. So it's not like you have like a man in the sky telling you, okay, you need to go here. It's all, I guess the idea is that like they have a journal and they write it down. Okay, now I'm not going to forget what to do. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot going on there. <laughs> That they need to remember. Yeah, like, what do we got to go? We got to go here. Yeah, okay. Have a journal. Let me write it down so I don't forget. <laughs> I'm 10. I don't remember anything. Yeah, I... But I'm also really smart and, like, can read all these runes and shit. Hey, you know, somebody's got to read between that duo. Um, yep. I, I want to touch... <laughs> really... I don't think Kratos is illiterate. I mean, but he no. is, isn't he? Is he? I'm pretty sure. He doesn't read. He... he, he I have no he idea. Can't... He can read. He just he just can't read certain tongues. Is what the word is. Tongues. Mm. Okay. He's it's illiterate like, in whatever language that is. I am. Um, yeah. I wanted to touch a little bit on the RPG mechanics that have been built into this game because obviously God of War not an RPG, and now clearly has a lot of RPG built in. But it feels 
like it's a natural fit. It doesn't feel shoehorned in. It feels like it was, this is the best version of God of War. And I kind of wish that they had made all of the other God of Wars like this. And then maybe I would have been more interested in them as a, as a whole. I like how there are several trees, but they're not overly complex. That you get <laughs> trees. To, Sorry. Yeah, that you get to choose your like, your focus from a combat person. What? what? It's trees, like several trees. I'm laughing. Sorry, I, just, I shouldn't have laughed. I shouldn't have distracted you. Someone asked me if I like God of War and how the trees are. Oh, the how trees. are the trees? How are the trees? There are there are trees and they're beautiful and it's not distracting for me at all. So I was just laughing at that person who's not here to appreciate my inside joke and therefore I interrupted you, Andrea, and I am so terribly sorry. Uh, you're forgiven. Forgive there are very many different kinds of beautiful trees in the game. Um, <laughs> what I like about it is like I, I like how that the the runes, the gemstones that you put into your gear, you know, adds something. I like how that there's different styles of gear that you can focus on, you know, this strength, vitality, defense, runic, and there's one luck. other. Luck. Luck. Um, yeah. And mm -hmm. you can kind of mix and match, you know, which is your play style. But it's not, it doesn't take like 30 hours to learn. It takes like, you know, like two to four hours to learn. And I like that because it feels like it gives you a sense of progression that's rewarding and meaningful without needing to relearn something that's so complex that you don't really master it until the very end of the game. I like the idea that I feel powerful now, even though I'm always looking to upgrade my gear and to buy new stuff, but I don't feel like I need to grind. And that's what I love because the grind part of RPGs always feels like such a time waster to me. And I don't feel the need to grind. I want to explore the world to find hack silver, to find different crafting materials because the world is so beautiful that I just want to go see it all. And that yeah, I, but I will say that it's probably to do with the difficulty level you're playing on. Like I imagine you'd have to grind more at higher levels. Well, at the well, more, of course, of course. But like I played, I played, um, you know, what was it? Uh, Assassin's Creed on, on very easy. And I had to grind, forever in that game and then, Shit, granted, really? I still I still liked it it was still really fun but it felt like I was grinding a lot you know and same with Monster yeah, Hunter girl. and and, <laughs> and a bunch of other games it just like the thing I wanted to say was the reason why I think this game is getting such amazing scores is because the balance is just so well executed it's all of the things you like about video games with none of the pain points that you don't like about video games. And that's where I think Sony Santa Monica really deserves like a giant round of applause because they've crafted an experience that has this amazing fluid balance between puzzle solving, exploration, combat, and cinematic narrative in such a way that it's truly a masterclass. And I feel comfortable using that word. Me too. I, I'm not there yet. Um, not to say that I think it's bad in any way because I don't, but I'm just... Um, and it's hard for me to like form thoughts right now. <laughs> That's fine. How about you play brain. it when you can you're, also when you're not reserve. Fever yeah, yeah, because we have to we have to move on to the next section. But like, why don't you just reserve your your extended thoughts? And not to say that I'm trying to pressure you into thinking the way that I think, even though I kind of am. Um, well, but, I think it's because like maybe because I'm playing on normal or whatever. I just don't feel. I don't feel. I mean, I don't feel unpowerful, but I don't feel like God of War. I don't feel like. Papa Kratos coming to like fuck shit up. Like I just feel like a dude who can punch some enemies and it takes but that, a while. To that might sometimes. be that might be the purpose of the current area that you're in. That might be it what might. the game's trying the narrative that they're trying to push is like obviously you have Kratos living in this middle bump fuck nowhere. Why is that he there? Well you can only assume it's because he was like, I'm getting the fuck out of Dodge. I'm gonna try to live a normal life, have a child, which is like okay, daddy Kratos. Um, well, we had a kid before that didn't work out so well. No, that didn't work. So on that note, what I was going to suggest too is if you're like me and you've only played half of like the first God of War and you want to know about Kratos and his backstory, I hopped on Wikipedia and read the Wikipedia entries for the first three games. Um, and I'm happy I did because it provides a lot of insight to some of this stuff that you will see and you're like oh so that's why he acted this way or that's why that happened and you have now granted you don't need to know that stuff in order to appreciate the scene in the moment but just having that it's it i think it adds an extra layer to it that um 
is worth it. It takes me like five minutes to read all three Wikipedia entries. They're short. Plots are short. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. So I'm curious. So Brit, because the one thing I've done, where I'm, I've thought to myself already, and I'm not that far in the game, is like, man, is this really like another thirty hours? Yes. Plus, I think that's the part where I'm getting. I'm already getting nervous. Well, no, I don't think I, it has to be. I think it can be, but it doesn't have to be. No, and I agree. It's, if you're playing on normal mode, obviously it'll probably take you longer. If you're playing on baby ass baby mode, you'll you'll whiz through it sooner. But what I really like about it, going back to kind of exploration and grinding, and I know we have to move on, so I'll make this quick, is I felt compelled, and I wanted to search out every single island that you find in this area that you go to, and I wa- and it's fun for me. And the exploration is rewarding because you can tell every area is crafted and it's super like good on detail and every area has its own story. And through there, you find the resources that are good for crafting. And some of the reason I don't think you have to do too much grinding is because the items that you need to like progress your gear is only found in certain areas that you are gradually introduced to. So I understand like 30 hours sounds like a lot, but they go by real quick because they're so fun. It's not, there's no filler here. And I know you hate filler, Shimer. I do. Don't worry. Yeah, this nothing in here feels like it's filler. Andrea, like she was saying, some parts feel open world, but it's not a huge, gigantic map with just a bunch of random stuff to explore. You're not going to find anything. There's something practically every corner you turn, and it's not massive in size. Yeah, no, the maps yeah. so far that they've, I've seen have been fine, have been like a good size, haven't been That's what she crazy. Said. Yeah. Yeah. I could always talk about gotta, this forever. Always got to slip it in there. But listen, um, I think um, at least our first impressions are the game is good, according to Steimer. She's enjoying it. The game is, uh, in a word, Brittany, masterpiece. Yeah. And I also would use the word masterpiece. I think that this is a console selling game. This is the best PlayStation 4 game yet. And if you are at all considering this game, do not consider any longer. You should play it. It's really fantastic. And this is coming from somebody who did not like Kratos as a character, who was not very fond of God of War as a franchise. And now I'm like all the way in. I'm like, I'm sold. I'm a, I'm a believer. And we will, a have, believer. we will have definitive thoughts on it once we all finish the game. And hopefully we'll be able to do a spoiler cast at some point. But for now... We're going to wrap it up and we hope that you guys enjoyed this this first look and that you guys are pumped and excited about the game as well. Um, again, thank you to PlayStation for providing us access to those game codes. When we come back, we will have a special segment from producer Tom. But before we go, I need to tell you that this hands-on segment has been brought to you by Ripped Gamers. If you've let life and gaming take the front seat for a while and your health is not where you want it to be, Tim from Ripped Gamers is here to help. Tim is an online weight loss coach who works exclusively with video gamers. He was overweight himself and he struggled to find a routine that worked for his busy game-filled lifestyle. Nowadays, he's 48 pounds lighter and he's still going in pursuit of abs like Kratos. His mission is to help as many gamers as possible and get started with their own weight loss journeys. To help you get started, he's offering two things, both of which are completely free. First, there's a step-by-step zero equipment required fitness and nutrition program you can download instantly. You can join the Ripped Gamers Facebook group for support and advice from other gamers during the journey. During the journey, And it's nearly 200 members strong now. That is awesome. Secondly, he's coaching people one-on-one. If you're serious about achieving your goals, he'll take away all the guesswork and show you exactly how to look more like Kratos with personalized coaching, completely online and 100% free. I mean, he's got some pretty impressive abs, pecs, and all those biceps. Kratos, Papa Kratos. All the muscles. He's lifting all of those tree tree trunks. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah, when he's just like, uh, okay, I think this is not a spoiler, but I thought it was really cute. So when... So his dad is just like lifting trees and shit, right? And at, at one point, I'm just gonna say the line he, Atreus yeah. says because I thought it was adorable. He yeah. was like, "Yeah, dad's always been really strong." <laughs> and you're like, "You're like, kid, what the fuck? 
fuck you just think that like it's normal for normal. someone to pick up a tree <laughs> it's there was but then also you have to be like he's that's the only people he's ever known or his mom and I his mean, dad yeah so like he doesn't know that that's yeah. not normal so i thought it was that was just the that line i actually laughed out loud it, there was, was a cute. surprising amount of comedy in it there was also a oh, line yeah. a little bit later on where you have to move a very heavy thing and um one of the NPCs is like, are you sure you can do it? And he's like, yeah, I got it. <laughs> okay, yeah, no worries. <laughs> oh, my God. It's so good. Um, so if you're excited to kickstart your weight loss journey and get super strong like Kratos, head over to RiftGamers.com. That's R-I-P-P-E-D-G-A-M-E-R-S.com and grab your free program and apply for coaching to get started on your journey today. Thank you to Tim and Ripped Gamers for sponsoring our show. When we come back, producer Tom Bach wants us to know or wants us to discuss getting older as a gamer. This is going to be a good one. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. This is the What's Good Games podcast. And this segment is brought to you by producer Tom Bach. If you are interested in producing a segment here on What's Good Games, you can go to patreon.com slash what's good games. Um, actually, I think our producer slots might be full right now. I got to double check. But there's plenty of other ways to get involved for just $1 a month. That will get you access to our happy hour Q&A, where we always go off the rails. Our Patreon exclusive video, our feed... And lots more. Again, patreon.com slash what's good game. So he wrote us and said, for me with a career and a family, I often wonder if my true love for gaming will ever lessen or wane. A weird part of me assumes that one day it will. Like, will I really be playing PUBG in my 60s? Haha. <laughs> But thus far, it has not happened. In fact, I would say I have as much love and excitement for gaming now in my 40s as I ever have. But I do often wonder if and when the day will come where it just won't be as important or appealing to me. So he asks several questions here. Do you ever think about a day when you might not be as avid a gamer as you are today? And if so, what do you think those circumstances would or could be, apart from just not having time or enough hours in the day, which I think hits us all really, that would have you been less engaged as a gamer than you currently are? Has your love of gaming waned or has it strengthened as you've gotten older? Where exactly are you today on that continuum from your teens to now? Is the passion for gaming as strong now as it ever was for you or has it faded away or has it faded in any way? Or from another angle, what has changed for you as a gamer as you've gotten older? Do you have less or more patience for certain things? This is certainly a lot for us to discuss, Tom. Thank you so much for this fantastic <laughs> topic. Um, this is definitely something I think all of us as gamers think about, especially if you're over the age of 25. You know, and you're out of college and you have a job or you have kids and responsibilities of being an adult are like starting to weigh on you. And you're like, do I can I continue to do this? Um, Steimer, what about you? Uh, how, how do you feel? Do you think that you are just as avid as a gamer today as you were 10 years ago? No. 100% not. Uh, even when I like. Um, and it's mostly that I don't have as much time as I once did. But I remember even my early days at IGN, which was not 10 years ago, but was also not yesterday. Um, I would just go, all I did was play games at that time in my life. Like I would just, I would just go home and play video games and I had literally no other hobbies. Um, so I think what's changed for me is like, as I've grown up, I've, I'm trying to broaden my horizons and not just play video games. So it's not that I love video games less. It's that I'm trying to do more with my time. Um, and there's just only so much of it that you have. So, uh, I think that's a lot of it. And I think a lot of it too is like video games are a interactive hobby, whereas it's a lot easier if you're tired or if you're sick to just watch a TV show or a movie or whatever. Cause you don't have to do anything. Like I've been sick. I could have played God of War today, but I just didn't have the energy to really put into it. So I think it's things like that as you get older. I mean, when I was younger, I, I didn't give a shit. I'd stay up till like two in the morning playing a game and then go to work the next day at a regular hour. And like, now I'm like, holy shit, I go to bed at like nine 30 or 10. So <laughs> that's a nope. That's crazy. Cause I, I was up until 3 AM last night playing <laughs> girl. High five. <laughs> oh my gosh. I can't, I just can't do that anymore. I don't, 
I just got real old. Or maybe, I don't know. I just really <laughs> like sleeping. So There's nothing hey, wrong with liking you. sleep. But, no. but Britt, what about you? I guess it depends how you want to define an avid gamer. Because I would say I'm more into gaming and the industry as a whole than I ever have been. I don't, because obviously this is our hopefully our career maybe one day we'll actually be able to make money off of this you know so i am more involved in the industry than i ever have been does that mean i have less time for video games yes so i guess it just kind of comes down to like how you want to separate the two um like you said we're back in the day it was just i would just be able to play games because it was my hobby and nothing else but now that this is my business my potential livelihood so there's a much different angle to it now i can't just play games as a hobby and sit down and walk away it's like you have to play the game you have to have like the critical analysis in your head. So like, like I said, it just kind of depends on like how, what do you want to define as a gamer or not? Um, I yeah, don't I see that. Say, oh, sorry. Yeah, go, no, go ahead. No, go on with your bad self, girl. No, I, I'll say I, I've no, I've gone in, in waves where I've been like, I don't even like video games anymore. And that's usually when I've gone too far down the, this is work rabbit hole and just burned out. So like, that's one of the reasons why I left IGN was I was like, this is miserable. Like, all you're doing is just grinding and trying to finish these games. And, like, it's not fun anymore. So yeah, I, well, if I had playing, to play Fallout well, New Vegas in 24 hours, I'd want to quit, too. <laughs> exactly, right? It's not it's not a fun way to play a video game. And I would argue it's not a great way to review a video game. Like, it's not – it's never yeah. – that's not a consumer experience, right? No one's going <laughs> to grab this game and play it for 24 – I mean, they might play well, it for 24 hours yeah. straight. But they won't be on the mission for the campaign, Andrea, like, to try to finish the campaign in 24 hours. And I think Andrea's dying. <laughs> I choked her water wrong. wrong. She's, okay. she, she, she's alive. No, no, she's totally alive. No, I agree with you, Simer. It's, I don't know. Getting old's weird, man. Sorry. I was yeah, trying to no, breathe my water instead of swallowing Don't breathe it. water. Don't, don't you don't do that. have gills. I'm not a fish. No, what? can confirm. <laughs> what about you, Andrew Renee? Are you able to talk now, or do you want us to stall a little bit longer for you? Uh, thank you. Um, I definitely... I am not as I, passionate is not the word. Um, I also don't have as much time for it today as I used to, even though I am very grateful that because of the work that we do with what's good and because of our awesome patrons like Tom and everybody else and the work that I do with kind of funny, I am allowed to take my time and really only play games that I'm really interested in playing instead of being assigned games that I don't really want to play, but I have to play, I do still feel a uh, pressure to play a variety of games so that we have something different to talk about on the show every week. Obviously, when I was playing a lot of Paragon, you know, I couldn't come to the show every week and only talk about Paragon uh, or only talk about Destiny or whatever other multiplayer game that I was into. And so that's always a concern for people like us that work in the industry. But I know that, you know, if the day comes that, you know, I decide to start a family, you know, if John and I have kids that that's definitely going to take a gigantic toll on it. And I'm always like in such awe of parents who are able to maintain a gaming lifestyle with kids because for all of the parents that I know that used to play games, they said that that was the number one thing that really kind of like put a damper on on the amount of video games that they play is because, you know, once you're a parent, your kids become your world. And you're, if you're Papa Kratos, that's true. Papa Kratos would still be playing video games. He tell would. you that much right now. Um, <laughs> when it comes about like, do I think my love of gaming, gaming will wane? I do. I think that if I ever decide to leave the video games industry and to pursue other career options that I will continue to play games from time to time, but I definitely won't <laughs> play them as often as I play them now. Uh, I'm with Tom. I don't see myself playing PUBG or any game like that into, into my 60s, even though I do love the idea of like gaming grandmas like your grandma, Britt. I think that like that would be really fun, especially having spent so much of my life in the video game business. But it's hard to say because, you know, as we get older, our priorities shift and the way that we want to spend our time shifts and who we want to spend it with um, shifts. But for for now, even for the time being, though, I think that my tastes in gaming have, have changed. And I like that. I like that I have a much more robust knowledge base of video games today than I did a decade ago. Because I liked what I liked back then. And I wasn't really interested in learning more. And then when I got 
of my first job in the video games business, I was like, oh, I really need to do my homework. There's a lot that I don't know. And there's still a lot that I don't know because our the the encyclopedia of video games is just so broad and vast. There's just no way to know everything about every franchise that's ever been made, you know? And I think that that's what's part of the reason why we love video games is because there's always something for everybody. But I can't see a future for me where I'm not playing games. And maybe it's because I have my gaming grandma and my aunt. You know, my grandma's in her late 70s and she yeah. plays games every day. Um, I mean, for me, it's something I've done for, you know, almost 30 for 25 years of my life. And it's something that I have just always innately loved. It's not that I had to force myself to like it. It's first and foremost, it's a hobby of mine and it's a passion. And for that reason, I don't see myself outgrowing video games i can see myself playing them till the day i'm worm fodder and i think what's really cool about us is well our industry is it grows up with you is people who we have our colleagues and our friends who have games they've been doing it doing it just as long as we have essentially and when you when you surround yourself with those people in that community yeah girl you got me with that that's what she said pillow youtube.com slash what's good game subscribe please uh and i think for that reason alone you know it's it's hard to fall out of it, especially if it's like a passion and hobby first and foremost. And also it's not like you reach a certain age and then not like Hollywood, Andrew, you probably can speak on that more than I can where you reach a certain age. And then now all of a sudden you're not qualified to participate in certain parts of that industry. Cause you're too old or some bullshit like that. I wouldn't use the word qualified. I would use the word believable because it, I know 10 years from today, that I will be incredibly qualified to talk about video games. But somebody who's 15 logging on to whatever platform is hot then, like the new mm -hmm. Vine or the, like Snapchat Live or whatever the fuck is happening, um, is, <laughs> would look at someone like me and be like, oh, she's out of touch. She doesn't know what she's talking about. I mean, shit, I get that now. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, it's just the well, audience. Like, <laughs> thankfully, with the gaming industry, everyone, like I said, grows with you, right? And so yeah. all those same people are going to know that you know your shit because you've accumulated that audience. I think I was talking more about in Hollywood. Like, at a certain point in Hollywood, I think you're too old to be something for this, that, and the other. And I feel like we don't have that in games. Maybe I'm wrong. Do you know what I mean? Um, Yeah, I definitely see what you're saying. I think that there's an argument to be made that typecasting definitely still exists in the, the world of on-camera reporting for video games, whether it be about video games, mo movies, TV, I, I would say even more so. I talk all the time about how I am trying to figure out a way to transition into lifestyle hosting because as much as I have loved hosting in video games, as I get older, I'm going to age out of hosting in video games. And people are like, no, you're not. And I'm like, yeah, I am. There are no f women who are in their 50s hosting on camera and video games right now. There are men, but there are no women. And I'm not saying that that's, you know, something that's not possible, but I'm not here to try to break down stereotypes or fight them. I'm here to have fun while I can and then maybe try something different. You know, maybe I'll, I'll be ready to be done because let's be honest, for me, playing video games in the public eye has been really tough. I'm a very private gamer. I love having my video game experiences be my own. And that's why streaming is so challenging for me, why we don't do a lot of streaming on What's Good Games and why Steimer was always like our number one streamer because mm -hmm. I, I just, I'm not good at it. I love doing live talk show format. Obviously, if you guys watch Games Daily, you know that. But the thing for me is like I love being by myself with a video game and having that immersive solo experience. Or I love playing in a private party with people that I know in an online space. But like sharing that publicly seems to be where the content is going. And I just, I'm not very good at it, nor do I want that. I kind of crave the day when I can play what I want, when I want, on the time that I want, and there's no expectations. And I know that sounds super selfish, but I'm, I think about it. No, no, I, I, I there, there was a day in my life, ladies and gentlemen, where I would replay Breath of Fire 3, Final Fantasy 9, over and over and over again because I, I love those games so much and I had the time and resources to do so. But now, you know, if I wanted to replay those games, that would take several hundred hours. And, especially, and I would shake my fist at you and be like, God damn it, Bert, put those retro games down. <laughs> Girl, no, it's happened when Divinity Original Sin 2 comes out on, on PS4, Xbox One this August. I'm, well, I'm I mean, we need, to we need to play that because I need to play that. Yes. Yeah. 
But no, it's it's true. There there was a good, no, Earthbound. I would just play Earthbound once a year, like around winter, because it sounded good. But now it's like you can't really do that because you got to play all the newest and the latest and the greatest. And this isn't like we're complaining about how we don't like what we do. We love what we do, but it's just a reality of it. I think a lot of people aren't aware of. Shifting gears just a little bit. Uh, do you feel that you play less of a variety of different games or a greater variety now? Are there certain ones that you have just outgrown? Any genres that you were that you used to play that now you're like, nah, dog, I ain't got time for that. Uh, thanks to the Switch, I would say I've actually broadened my video game horizons, especially with games like Dark Side Detective, Night in the Woods, even you know Edith Finch when I played on PC. Like those are games I typically would not play, but because I see people talking about it, and I just love my Switch for little indie titles, and I fly a lot, so that has really helped broaden my gaming horizons and I recently started getting back into JRPGs and that was like my bread and butter growing up and it took me probably like five or ten years before I like revisited that those genres again but I love it Steimer any genres that you used to play but now you're like I really don't want to play this I've always had a fairly wide variety of games that I've played um I don't really feel like that's changed much. I still don't really play horror games and I still don't really play fighting games. And I feel like those are the two genres where I'm like, eh, absolutely not. Don't even talk to me about them. I don't care. Uh, but for the most part, there's, if you can, like, I would say God of War is a game that I would have never been interested in before. Um, and I think because of the way that they've grown it, sort of grown his, him as a character up and like grown the, the game as a franchise up, if that makes any sense. I don't know. Mm -hmm. but, it does, uh, yeah. Th therefore, I am now more interested in it. If they'd come out with this game and it was the same Kratos yelling at the top of his lungs and like, <laughs> I don't know, he was just mad about something else. Athena! I would have not played this game. I would have just been like, meh. Mm -hmm. I don't care. Um, so I think that's kind of where I'm at is like I, I play games now that speak to me on some level um, and that are I feel are doing something interesting. I'm not just going to play a bunch of games to play a bunch of games because I don't have time to like to weed through all the stuff. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of where mm -hmm. I'm at. No, I, I'm, I'm with you. Like I think about certain genres of games that you know, sometimes we have to like go to in like preview events or whatever. And I'm just like, no, I don't like this. Like roguelikes, for example. And I know people out nope. there like gasping, like, oh, how dare you not like roguelikes? And I just like, they're just a style of video game that I just don't like. So sometimes we'll go to these events and I'll like have to play it. And I'm like, it's not you. It's me. I just have never liked this. And I've had to cover them in the past. And I just don't really like them. It's not a knock on your game. I just, it's not, it's just not for me, you know? And so I think about, about games like that. I think about, um, you know, uh, fighting games is a good one. I will definitely make time for a game like Injustice or Mortal Kombat or really just anything NetherRealm does because I love NetherRealm. But, you know, somebody asked me, they're like, hey, are you going to get into DBZ at all? And I was like, no. <laughs> like I have no desire to start playing like you know DB fighters I just don't you know and um, uh, Jared asked me if I was going to try Soul Calibur and I was like what? No. yeah that's going to be a no for me um, and I love how it's refreshing how some people that I know on camera just are able to be like nah that's just not for me somebody else is going to cover that uh, you know, and and I, I don't know if that's related to getting older as a gamer, more so being more confident in my taste in the types of creative experiences that I choose to enjoy versus things that I have to cover because we have to try to keep our coverage as broad as possible, you know, and so it's it's an interesting idea to think about you know, games that I used to like. I think about rhythm and music games, how they were such a huge part of my game, but or part of my life for so long. And, you know, we play, I don't know if it was a secret segment or what, where we were talking about games that we would sacrifice, that if we had to pick a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was a secret segment, I think. Um, and I was like, I would, I would sacrifice Rock Band because I had that moment of my life where it meant so much to me. And I played 
thousands of hours of Guitar Hero and Rock Band games. But now it's like when Rock Band 4 came out, I could barely get myself to pick it up and play. Because I think like I that had that moment in my life where it was so big for me for so many years. But now I'm like, I think I'm, I think I'm ready to say goodbye. I think I'm ready for it to be done and over. Has there been a, a specific game like that for either of you that you used to play in that now you're like, I'm totally okay with not ever playing that game again? Mm-hmm. Not no, in that for, way. Not that no, I, yeah. For me, it would pro- well, I mean, I did play a lot of Guitar Hero, but it wasn't like a significant to my oh, life. I never you know, did. I did. But that was like something I really loved, and I tried to get into the new ones, and it just fell flat. Um, for me, I would say for a long time, that was probably JRPGs. I was like, you know, I've put enough JRPGs in my time and I don't need to play them anymore. But then recently I started getting back into them and the the addiction has become real again. But I'm trying to stay away. I don't I don't have a good answer for that. That's um, okay. You don't have to have sorry, an answer. So. Um, hopefully this has been thought provoking for you guys listening out there, thinking about, you know, getting older as a gamer. We know we have a lot of um, people who listen to the show that are in their 30s, 40s and beyond and talking about what it means to be an older gamer and and how your habits change and and what's different. Um, So thank you so much for that fantastic discussion, Tom. This was a really awesome topic, something I think, you know, we all think about kind of casually in the back of our minds, but we don't necessarily have like a roundtable discussion on. But it would be interesting. Maybe at our next meetup, we can kick it around with some of you guys over some beers or something or some whiskeys with picklebacks. Yeah. Or some people yeah. take those at Paxi's. Picklebacks. Picklebacks. <laughs> um, Sodium. So that is going to wrap it up for our show for this week. Um, again, patreon.com slash what's good games. If you guys want to get in on that action, we will be having our live streams for the month of April on Tuesday, April 24th. April 24th. Mark it in your calendars, Tuesday, April 24th. We will be doing our happy hour Q&A and our after hours party stream. Um, So giving you guys a little bit of a heads up this time around. Um, We also have finalized a date for the What's Good Games one year anniversary celebration. It's Friday, May 11th. So we aren't announcing what we're going to do yet because we're still finalizing those details. But Friday, May 11th, there will be a stream of some kind, more than one hour, a multiple hour stream. Um, And we're really excited to celebrate our one year anniversary with you guys. So also mark that in your calendars, Friday, May 11th. Um, I guess that's really all the housekeeping that I have. Facebook.com slash what's good games is a place you can find us. Twitter. What's good underscore games. You can find us at youtube.com slash what's good games. And um, we'll be back next week. Until then. Yeah, it's weird. We like, don't have any conventions. I know. Coming up. I, I feel so like I should like be promoting do. a PAX panel, but they happened. Mm-hmm. We have a glorious weekend off. And I hope that you all take some time this weekend for some self care, whether that means sleeping in, going for a walk, eating your favorite Taking dessert, all of your antibiotics. Or that all of the drugs or playing video games. Um, Thank you so much for being a part of the show. We love you guys. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next time.